Good morning. And before we get going, I just want to wish a happy 243rd birthday to the United States Marine Corps. I'm Kevin Bo Miller, and I'm the Veterans Service Officer here in town. And we welcome you to our Veterans Day ceremony this year, where we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the end of World War One. Color guard, please post the colors. The Reading Memorial High School Band Ensemble will now perform the national anthem. I ask you to please stand if you are able. Reading Girl Scouts will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I now welcome Father Stephen Rock from St. Agnes Parish, Captain United States Navy, retired for an opening prayer. Kevin, I want to thank you and your committee on behalf of the Reading Clergy Association for pushing this back to 1230 so it didn't interfere with religious services in the various churches. And also for a point of transparency I'm now the administrator of both parishes, St. Agnes and St. Athanasius. So you got me in trouble with the folks from St. Athanasius here <laughs> by not having their na name in the, in the program. <laughs> Moving on. Let us pray. Oh God, as we have remembered the sacrifices of so many men and women who have served so well the cause of liberty, the sad thing is we live in a world today that is full of frustration anger and dissension, which has even affected a handful of students in our own town here of Reading. We ask you to have mercy on your people and open our hearts to your peace and love. Help us to remember the sacrifices of the men and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice for freedom, but also those who have served and continue to serve our country at home and around the world, ensuring our freedom and attempting to make the world a better place. O oh Lord, we ask you in your love and mercy to look over and protect the families of our veterans as well. And as we commemorate today, the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, the war to end all wars, grant that America and all nations may continue to work for true peace and justice for all peoples. Bless us in your service and help us to follow you more faithfully. In your holy name we pray, amen. Thank you, Father Steve. Please be seated. Again, thank you all for coming out today in this bright but, but chilly day. 
On this Veterans Day, we mark the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. Please spare a thought for our World War I heroes that most of us never met. They fought at Somme, at Meuse Argonne, at Vittoria Veneto. These are not locations well known as Iwo Jima, Normandy, or Anzio. But it is right and just that we remember the heroes who fought and died for freedom in the war to end all wars. And I welcome Brendan Manning, who will read the Veterans Day proclamation from the governor. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a proclamation. Whereas, since the Commonwealth's colonial days, thousands of men and women have served our country in defense of freedom and liberty, and whereas on November 11, 1918, the armistice was signed in the force of Compagnie by the Allied nations and Germany, ending World War I, the war to end all wars, after four years of conflict, and whereas since that day, every November, people from around the nation have gathered to honor our veterans, and whereas there are approximately 388,000 veterans living in Massachusetts, and whereas today we are reminded of the great sacrifices and contributions our veterans have made to our country, and whereas we honor and salute those who served our country throughout the generations with honor, patriotism, and courage, and whereas it is appropriate that all Massachusetts citizens remember the bravery of those who served their country, that their dedication and sacrifices serve as a reminder of the cost of our freedom. And whereas in November 2018, the world will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the armistice that ended the fighting in World War I at 11 a.m. November 11, 1918, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Now, therefore, I, Charles D. Baker, Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, do hereby proclaim November 11th, 2018, to be Veterans Day, and urge all the citizens of the Commonwealth to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in its observance. Given at the Executive Chamber in Boston, the 11th day of November in the year 2018, and of the Independence of the United States, 247 years. Signed by His Excellency Charles G. Baker, Governor, Tyranny Polito, Lieutenant Governor, and William Francis Galvin, Secretary of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Brandon. Nice job. Since August 2nd, 1990, and with the beginning of Operation Desert Shield, our country has been at war. During that time, our Guard and Reserve Forces have been called upon like never before. They have done so much to sustain a very high operation tempo for the past 28 years. Some individuals have deployed four and five times. Please keep these Guard and Reserve members and their families in, the, in your thoughts and prayers. And again, as tough as deployments are for members and families, transitions home are also very difficult. Please support them in any way you can. I'd now like to welcome Girl Scout Maureen Manning to read Thank a Vet. Thank a Vet. If you love your country, thank a Vet. If you cherish freedom, thank a vet for the price they paid. For the price they paid, for the sacrifice they made, if you love your country, thank a vet. They gave us the best years of their youth to protect the red, white, and blue. Whether land or air or on the sea, they defend our liberty. If you love your country, thank a vet. If you cherish freedom, thank a vet. For the price they paid, for the sacrifice they made. 
If you love your country, if you cherish freedom, if you love America, thank a vet. Thank you, Murray. Ryland Fiscus will now read Aftermath by Siegfried Sassoon. This poem was written in 1919, shortly after Sassoon was discharged from service. Have you forgotten yet? For the world's events have rumbled on since those gagged days. Life like traffic checked while at the crossing of city ways and the haunted gap in your mind has filled with thoughts and that flow like clouds in the lit heaven of life and you're a man reprived to go taking your peaceful share of time with joy to spare but the past is just the same and war is a bloody game have you forgotten yet look down and swear by the slain of the war that you'll never forget do you remember the dark months you held the sector at Mametz? The nights you watched through wired and dug and piled sandbags on parapets? Do you remember the rats and the stench of corpses rotting in front of the front line trench? And dawn coming dirty white and chill with a hopeless rain? Do you ever stop and ask, is it all going to happen again? Do you remember the hour of din before the attack? and the anger, the blind compassion that seized and shook you as you peered at the doomed and haggard faces of your men. Do you remember the stretcher cases lurching back with dying eyes and lolling heads? Those ashen gray masks of the lads who once were keen and kind and gay. Have you forgotten yet? Look up and swear by the green of the spring that you'll never forget. Thank you, Ryland. And now I'd like to continue a tradition of recognizing the heroes in our neighborhood. These men are our neighbors. They went off around the world to protect our freedoms and were fortunate enough to return to enjoy these freedoms. They returned and became our flooring business owners, photographers, telephone technicians, and patrol officers. Corporal Arthur Hubbard United States Army landed on Omaha Beach in June 1944, not once, but twice. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, Arthur was part of a four-man reconnaissance mission sent ashore to locate their lieutenant, who had gone ahead to locate their unit landing position. Unable to locate the lieutenant, the four men returned to LST-510. And on D-Day plus one, June 7, 1944, Corporal Hubbard and his unit, the 110th Triple Eight Gun Battalion, landed on Omaha Beach. It was described as the neighborhood junkyard with burned out tanks and landing craft piled all over it. Only there were bodies too. For the next 15 months, the 110th performed the mission to include liberating Paris. They fought in the Ardennes in the Battle of the Bulge and were on their way to Berlin when the war ended. In the words of Brigadier General Timberline, the fighting instincts, esprit de corps, outstanding efficiencies of the men of the 110th AAA Gun Battalion was reflected in their performance. During the campaign, they participated in 601 aerial engagements destroying 65 enemy planes, had 22 ground engagements, destroying 11 tanks, 80 armored and motor vehicles, as well as innumerable gun positions, bunkers, ammunition, supply dumps, and greatly facilitating the advance in fr of frontline infantry. Arthur returned to Medford after the war, entered the flooring business, and at one point actually carpeted the court, captain's quarters on the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> Arthur, as a member of the greatest generation, the United States Army served in Korea for 15 months with the 180th Infantry Regiment, 
45th Infantry Thunderbird Division, Oklahoma, Oklahoma National Guard. Before returning home, he was assigned as Sergeant Major of the 3rd Infantry Battalion. He was recently awarded the Korean Ambassador of P for Peace Medal from the Republic of Korean government in appreciation for his service and sacrifices. Larry's long career as a photographer continues to this day. Larry, thank you for your service. <laughs> Specialist, fourth class, Lawrence Leahy, served with the United States Army. He was stationed in Vietnam with the hundred with the 11th Combat Supply Company of the 1st Logistics Command, 506th Field Depot, Camp Davies. He served as a logistics specialist responsible for supporting all military efforts in the Saigon area. He was the one that made the right parts and supplies were at the right place at the right time. After service, he had a 32-year career with the New England Telephone Company. Larry, thank you for your service. You can say a few words if you want to, Larry. <laughs> Sergeant First Class Michael Lee served five years active duty with the United States Army Military Police. He served in Fort Carson, Colorado and Freiburg, Germany. Since leaving active duty, he has remained a member of, of the Army Reserve for the past 25 years. His deployments include Bosnia, Herzegovina in 2000-2001, Iraq in 2002-2004, Afghanistan 2010-2011, and he anticipates deploying again to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba in the spring of 2019. Mike has been a patrol officer in Reading for the past 20 years. We thank you for your continue, continuing military service and your service to protect us as a Reading patrol officer. Mike, thank you for your service. There are many more heroes among us today that have displayed the same commitment, courage, and service during war and peacetime. I salute all of you and thank you for your service. I now welcome Mr. Barry Berman, Vice Chair of the Reading Select Board for a Veterans Day Address. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin, for putting this together. Good morning, I should say good afternoon, everybody. Honored guests, Father Rock, Senator Lewis, welcome back. We're gonna work you like a government mule on behalf of Reading, <laughs> trust us. And also, our honored veterans and their families. Exactly 100 years ago today, the guns fell silent, ending what was the first modern war in history. It was known as the Great War, since we hadn't gotten around to numbering the wars yet, and since this was supposed to be the war to end all wars. No one could possibly fathom the conflict that would start a mere 21 years later. Reading certainly had its heroes then, men and women, and I can't wait to hear what my friend Virginia Adams has to say about this later. My father was a U.S. Army veteran who served during the Korean conflict. If he were alive today, he'd be the same age as Mr. McHugh. From 1950 to 51, his artillery unit was deployed to Germany as part of the occupational force which oversaw the rebuilding of Western Europe and the checking of our new enemy, the Soviet Union. For a number of months, he was stationed in the Munich area. While there, they camped in a small town outside the city called Dachau. Their barracks were on the grounds of that infamous concentration camp. Where formerly, which were formerly occupied by German guards and SS troops. A few yards from where they laid their heads were the gas chambers and the crematoria, which they hadn't yet gotten around to dismantling. It did not look much different than it did five years earlier 
when their older brothers liberated the camp in 1945. While disturbing in its own right, especially for a young Jewish soldier from New York, what was chilling for him and his buddies, Jews from New York, Italians from Philadelphia, dirt farmers from Georgia, was that the same soldiers who oversaw the mass murder of an entire race were now wearing lederhosen, welcoming their new American friends, serving them drinks in the Munich beer halls while denying knowledge or participation in any of the activities which had occurred outside of town. They tried to sanitize their history and their culpability in it. This lesson was not lost on my father. When he returned and started his own family, he tried to instill in me and my brothers not only a deep respect for our Jewish faith, but also for history and for justice. What he witnessed sickened him and his non-Jewish comrades alike. <coughs> Two weeks ago today on this spot, hundreds of Red Reading residents, Jewish and Gentile, gathered in support of their Jewish neighbors and to stand up to the recent spate of anti-Semitic hate graffiti which has permeated our schools in our town. Since then, the hate graffiti has expanded to include African Americans and members of our L LGBT community. At that time, I addressed the gathering by saying the swastika is not only an affront to Jews, but it's an affront to all Americans who love democracy, freedom, and peace. And today I want to add that whether this cowardly behavior is motivated by hate or malice or just outright stupidity, it is a direct slap in the face to every veteran who's ever put on the, union, on the uniform. Men and women have gone far afield and have died to preserve and protect the rights of every American. You cannot honor the brave men and women who we celebrate today and shrug your shoulders and say it's not just a bunch of stupid kids. We cannot ha you cannot have a bumper sticker on your car that says support the troops while gas the Jews is scrawled on the Parker wall. You cannot fly the American flag on your home and stay home when anti-gay graffiti is scrawled with impunity in bathroom stalls. You cannot say thank you for your service and not be appalled that the N-word and direct threats to our African-American neighbors appear with reckless abandon in our classrooms. As a community, we have got to come together and stand up and say enough is enough and that this is not who we are. We do this not only for the targeted groups, but for each other. And if that's not enough, let's do it for those who have risked all to protect the freedoms we have all taken for granted, our veterans. On Tuesday, this conversation is going to continue at the select board, where we'll honor Holocaust survivor Dr. Anna Ornstein for her work in bringing people together and developing strategies to eradicating hate. I will participate in that conversation, not only as an elected official, a member of the Jewish faith, and as American, but also as the son of a US Army veteran who saw firsthand the attempt to deny the atrocities and warned that without vigilance, they can occur again. So I say to all the veterans gathered here, I do thank you for your service. And in, uh, and in your honor, I hope we can continue to make Reading a truly loving, welcoming community where everyone feels safe and can participate in what this great town and country have to offer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. And I welcome Senator Jason Lewis. Senator Lewis is always a champion at the State House for veterans' causes and we're glad to have him around for another couple years. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for your service. And thank you to Selectman Berman for your powerful and, and important words that you shared with us. Distinguished guests, veterans, and fellow citizens, it's an honor to join you this afternoon for a particularly important and meaningful celebration of Veterans Day, because of course, this Veterans Day is the 100th anniversary, the centennial since the end of World War I. Despite a late entry to the war in 1917, our nation committed its full might 
to this terrible conflict. Almost three million of our fellow Americans served abroad during World War I. 53,000 were killed in action. 63,000 died from disease and other causes and more than 200,000 were wounded. On November 11, 1919, the first celebration of Armistice Day, President Woodrow Wilson spoke to the nation. And here's part of what he said. To us in America, the reflections of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride in the heroism of those who died in the country's service and with gratitude for the victory both because of the thing from which it has freed us and because of the opportunity it has given America to show her sympathy with peace and with justice in the councils of the nations. Armistice Day was later renamed Veterans Day in 1954 and of course now we honor and celebrate the service and the sacrifice of all our United States military veterans. As President George Washington said, the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by our nation. I think we can be proud that here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we are viewed as national leaders in the quality and the comprehensiveness of the veterans' services that we provide on a state and on a local level. We hold our veterans in the highest regard. Earlier this year, the state legislature passed the BRAVE Act, and was signed into law by Governor Baker. And it's a new law which further expands veterans' benefits and increases access to a range of services for veterans, active duty military, and their families. For example, the BRAVE Act will assist veterans and their families with certain employment protections, housing assistance, uh, increase in, bur in the burial expenses, court programs and medical care, and also expanding honors and recognition for veterans and service members. It is the sacrifice of our veterans and their families that makes our nation great. And it is their willingness to sacrifice that elevates the dignity of all humanity. Our veterans have earned our admiration and we will remain forever in their debt. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lewis. The high school, and high school band ensemble will now perform America the Beautiful. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Virginia Adams, a 40-year charter member of the Reading Historical Society, is joining us today. There's currently a wonderful display at the Reading Public Library that Virginia designed about the Reading citizens that took part in World War I. I encourage you to stop by and take a look at it. We are fortunate to have Virginia with us to share a bit about what was happening in Reading. 100 years ago today, as World War I ended. Virginia, welcome. Mothers of the newspaper editor. 
by the time the letters made it to print, the news, which was heavily redacted, was at least one month old. However, despite its lateness, it was news from abroad and read by the population, which in 1918 was just about 4,000 people. One of the published letters describes in detail the war activity as experienced by Private William A. Riley. Here are a few selected sections he wrote in his own words. France, October 12, 1918. Dear Mother, I am now with the ammunition train of the 3rd Division. I am in what might have been a good town once, but only stone walls now. Fritz isn't satisfied yet either. He throws big ones over here every night, and sometimes they do damage. Yesterday morning, we were lined up getting our chow when Fritz started throwing a large hummingbird at us. A piece of shrapnel hit a fellow in the head about six feet away from where I was standing, and it was hunt for a hole if you had one. Most of us hadn't. So we had to, uh, to hope he would break his neck and next time be shot. I guess he did, too, because he stopped firing until last night when he started again. I was asleep under the wagon alone, and I heard the gas alarm. I had my mask on for over an hour. And some of the fellows had a laugh on me because it had only lasted 10 minutes. This was getting to be a lovely life when you only have the clothes you've got on. I have to wait for a sunny day and then wash my clothes and then go to bed until they dry. I mean, lie under a tree somewhere. I haven't slept on even a bed of hay for so long, I'd be afraid to now. But I'm feeling all right as long as I don't have to do it forever. And then, the November issue of the Chronicle printed a photo of Private Riley and announced that he died of shell wounds in France. As you know, the war to end all wars ended with the signing of the armistice on November 11th in 1918. But Reading celebrated with a false start. Oops. <laughs> Here, here's how it was reported in the Chronicle on November 8th big bold letters. Peace is postponed. This is November 8th. At 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon, the Reading fire alarm sounded, and shortly before the church bells commenced to peal, crowds gathered in the streets and excitement constantly increased. This celebration was in consequence of a cablegram proclaiming an armistice between Germany and the Allies was signed at 11 o'clock that day, which was the 7th, and that hostilities had ceased at 2. In effect, the war had ended. Spontaneously, the Executive Committee on Celebration was formed. The services of the Reading Brass Band and the Company Fife and Drum Corps were engaged for a monster parade in the evening to include company and semi-militant organizations, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, civilians, and all who felt equal to a five-mile hike. <coughs> Red Fire was bought in quantity and came in the afternoon train. I don't know what red fire is, but I suspect it was for uh, fireworks. And then, in quotes, the traditional conservative Reading look before you leap spirit asserted itself. And by use of the wire, it was finally learned that Secretary Lansing advised postponement of all celebrations, and accordingly, it was decided to wait until tonight. The news in this morning's papers made further postponement advisable. And it continued. But peace will not long be deferred. The hunt is done. No, no consideration for him influences the march of events. But we want to save all our boys we can. And now when the magic word peace 
authentically appears in the skies, Redding's arrangements are practically concluded for a demonstration that will be a demonstration indeed.